next speaker is going to be Dr. Han Yi, who's directing the uh, spinal radio surgery program here at Yale. Thanks so much, Dr. Mandel. I really appreciate you, the uh, Seattle Science Foundation, Dr. Chapman, for inviting me. It is uh, quite an honor to be able to join you guys. So, uh, Dr. Bilski, certainly um, one of the luminaries in your field, uh, discuss a little bit about primary uh, bone uh, radiation, radio surgery approaches. I'll talk a little bit more about metastases and some of the radiation, especially radio surgical options available for metastases. Uh, very briefly, just uh, some basic radiation biology. Uh, radiation can be produced uh, either within the nucleus or outside the nucleus. But essentially, the, the resultant energy, the photon, um, it makes no difference. So you can call it X-rays depending, or gamma rays, depending on where the source is. But the way that the, the photon actually is able to uh, elicit DNA damage in the cancer, essentially, there has to be uh, interactions typically with, uh, with uh, hydrogen or water causing radicals uh, that will lead to DNA damage. Um, and this is the majority of the radiation, ionized radiation, is this is the, uh, the methodology. Um, we know that certainly the DNA damage also occurs for normal non-cancerous tumors or cells, excuse me, um, rather than just the, specifically the cancer. But we do think that when we fractionate the radiation, uh, this is radiation biology, really classic, classic radiation biology over decades. If we deliver the radiation dose over many sessions, sometimes up to seven, eight weeks, nine weeks of uh, daily radiation, we think that the cancer ha has much less capacity for DNA repair compared to the surrounding normal non-cancerous cells. Um, and then this has been the traditional radiation approach. I do want to uh, say that, you know, when, uh, when we've developed the radiation very traditional radiation, the conformal, uh, conformal conventional radiation was radiation that was also targeted to a relatively large area. So, um, you know, even as, as much as, you know, 10, 20 years ago, and even now, we still, for a lot of our conventional radiation cases, we use a CT scan to plan the radiation. And then we have the radiation into the body through one, two, three, four different angles. If we're treating, for, for instance, here, the stomach, if this is a stomach uh, cancer and lymphoma or palliative treatment, um, in this situation, we have four different entry beams. They all meet around the stomach. That's where you get the full dose. But you see that you do have relatively high doses um, elsewhere as the beam enters and exits the, the body. Um, with more modern uh, radiation machines, we're able to have very high-tech uh, ability to shape the radiation field. These are called uh, multi-leaf collimators that are able to actually, in real time, as the radiation is being delivered, constantly change uh, the shape, constantly alter the radiation dose. Um, and, um, and that's allowed us to become even more conformal with radiation treatment compared to a long time ago. The intensely modulated radiation treatment, this is using those uh, multi-leaf collimators, using very advanced computer algorithms, uh, and being able to uh, come up with really conformal treatment field that we didn't have, you know, 20 years ago before IMRT. So if we did just the conventional radiation treatment of the pelvis, you see it's a very relatively even radiation dose in kind of the box-shaped field that uh, is the product of uh, the, uh, the entry beams. With IMRT, we're able to much more conformally shape the radiation dose around our target volumes. In this case, spare some of the high-dose radiation to the small intestines. However, radiosurgery is a very different philosophy in terms of radiation. Rather than the fractionated conventional radiation where you deliver relatively low standard doses every day over, say, many weeks, you, we use, uh, instead of that, well, that would be the slow chisel, you use a sledgehammer to really give high doses of radiation in a much more pinpoint fashion to, to do what we think uh, hopefully is the case. Rather than pure DNA damage um, over a long period of time, really try to bleach, really try to um, get rid of the tumor in as few as one treatment. Um, radio surgery history goes back to actually uh, neurosurgery. <laughs> this is Dr. Lexell, a Swedish neurosurgeon. He invented, helped invent the gamma knife. These days, radio surgery can be delivered in a lot of different areas of the body with the brain using gamma knife, but certainly uh, lung, um, prostate, liver, uh, bone, and then certainly spine. The key idea with radio surgery, it's fewer treatments, one to five sessions typically in the U.S., very high doses per session, and we need very careful radiation treatment design, as well as what we call 
um, and mobilization and targeting, where not just the, uh, the fact that uh, we know the patient may move a tiny bit during treatment, but we really have to try to control for that, much, much more so than we're delivering those low doses over nine weeks. Uh, the radiation biology, as we mentioned, because of the higher doses per session, we think that we have a very different radiation biology response, not so much relied on cell cycling or oxygenation, uh, and we think that there could be potential advantages of using radiosurgery compared to the fractionated radiation. Uh, with spine metastases in general, um, very, very common. So certainly much more common than a lot of the primary bone tumors. This is in terms of bread and butter for most radiation oncologists seeing and being, uh, being comfortable with using conventional radiation for spine metastases just because uh, your metastatic breast cancer, lung cancer um, patients are just so common, unfortunately. Uh, the histology is clearly very important. Um, you have really wide-ranging uh, uh, chances for survival of patients. You have wide-ranging, basically, um, uh, radiation sensitivity of some of the histologies, whereas you have uh, certainly some histologies like your uh, lymphomas, my myelomas, where they're exquisitely radiation sensitive. You have some cancers on the opposite end of the spectrum, of sarcomas, your uh, melanomas, your renal cell uh, carcinomas, where we think that using conventional radiation in particular has a much lower chance for durable local control. And, and, the, and the metastatic space is, is evolving tremendously in the last 10 years. Not only do you have new therapies that can allow some patients to live much, much longer with metastatic cancer, uh, in particular immunotherapy for patients with high you know, pdl one expression, for instance, lung cancer uh, especially, we now know that there are subsets of some of these metastatic patients where they have really, um, they have novel um, targeted therapies available due to specific driver mutations. Uh, common examples would be within lung adenocarcinomas, your EGFR ALK mutations. And these patients can survive much, much longer, many years more than kind of the long, no, the, the classic um, prognosis. Uh, when conventional spine radiation is given, this kind of harkens back to what I showed with the stomach you really have a very even dose of radiation throughout where the radiation beam is coming in. Most commonly, it's one beam from the front of the body, one beam from the back. You give the same dose to the spinal cord, same dose to the tumor, same dose to even the here, in this case, the anterior mediastinum. Okay. Uh, and we know that, yes, there's some uh, good chance for pain response, short-term pain response from a lot of the classic trials that were done. But we know that the pain response is not 100%. And we know that the local control is also not 100%. And in this case of mine, this was a, a metastatic melanoma patient um, where uh, the patient actually had surgery at an outside institution, not a ton of debulking of the tumor. There was just uh, some stabilization. We gave uh, conventional radiation just because there was no space between tumor and, uh, in this case, the cotoquino and some of the major nerves. And then eight months later, we see that there's progression of the tumor despite the conventional radiation. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit earlier than, than certainly usual, but not necessarily surprising, particularly given this radio resistance histology. So the alternative is radio surgery of the spine. Uh, Dr. Bilski mentioned already a little bit about uh, the basic design, but essentially what we're using is we're using all the modern techniques to give as much dose as safely possible to the tumor in the spine, to the bone, uh, at risk for harboring microscopic uh, disease, and then trying to spare radiation um, as much as possible to surrounding spinal cord or our major nerves. Um, in this case, we're able to get the dose drop off from at least 18 gray down to about 10 to 12 gray over just a couple millimeters, which is very unique. Uh, this is not, there's very few places in the body where we get this rapid uh, dose drop off over distance. Um, and so, you know, essentially spine radiosurgery, SBRT, we're able to give more dose. So just some basic mathematic modeling, which is just a model for how much radiation dose can be delivered when you're altering the dose per session, the radiation dose per treatment and number of treatments. But essentially, if we're treating anywhere between 14 to 40 um, gray BED, biologically equivalent dose with conventional radiation, we're trying to essentially escalate dose anywhere between 60 to even 80 gray BED with SBRT. Uh, we have evidence that uh, pain relief, complete pain relief, uh, can be better following SBRT compared to conventional radiation. Uh, very good quality of life from the MD Anderson data. And then now, this is just in the last two years, now we have actually randomized prospective evidence that the pain relief can be better with a dose escalated radio surgery compared to conventional radiation. This is uh, the Toronto um, Princess Margaret trial, our multi-institutional trial led by, by Princess Margaret. 
they uh, randomized 24 grain, two fractions SBRT uh, against 20 grain and five fractions. Notably, this is all comers in terms of uh, spine metastases. They did not have to be just uh, radiosensitive histologies. That They included radio, uh, radio-resistant histologies. They included patients without oligomastic disease, where um, some, some patients, uh, if they have only one metastasis in the whole body that's active, we tend to lean more towards being aggressive locally with radiation because that could potentially dictate their overall course of treatment. In this case, they were uh, willing to um, enroll any patient even with non-oligomastic disease. When they looked at the primary endpoint at... Um, three months of complete pain response, it was uh, certainly improved with the SBRT, stereotactic uh, radiation, 35% of patients compared to just 14% of, of the conventional group. And that held the complete response being improved with SBRT at six months as well, 32% versus 16%. Notably, they noticed in terms of toxicity, very low risk for vertebral compression fracture, um, 1% in both groups, and no difference between the dose escalated SBRT versus conventional, and um, some minor grade two uh, toxicities. Pain flare um, was seen, but it was actually seen in both groups as well. Um, and unfortunately, um, no, a very, very uh, great poor toxicity. Um, when we approach spine radiosurgery for selection, uh, in particular, we look at for patients that have had prior radiation to the spinal cord nearby, where now we need to try to really get that dose separation between the spinal cord and tumor. Uh, we think uh, more carefully about using radiosurgery if they have, as I mentioned, the radio resistant histologies. And then we know that there are other features that predict for worse uh, response to conventional radiation in terms of local control when there's uh, these complicated uh, spinal metastases, significant osteous extension, um, certainly, we really want to make sure with SBRT because we really are going for a, a more durable local control uh, probability that patients do have a good, a better chance for survival. So if someone's on their third or fourth line of treatment, they're going for phase one trials, and they're cancer progressing throughout the whole body, these are generally not great candidates for radiosurgery. In fact, radiosurgery takes t- more time to plan and more time to deliver, even if it's one or two sessions, uh, because of the really... Uh, modern radiation planning involved. Sometimes it can take up to two to three weeks between when we meet the patient and, and when we actually start the radiation. So if someone has, say, four, five, six weeks of uh, life expectancy, these are certainly not great candidates for uh, for radiosurgery. Um, this is absolutely a very multidisciplinary uh, um, clinical consideration. I work very closely with Dr. Uh, Mendel um, discussing pretty much every case uh, with uh, radiosurgery. I always have a meet with the patient. We really want to make sure, one, right, that the stability, spine stabi- stability makes sense. There is a risk for a compression fracture after radiosurgery. If there's already concern for instability, then the, this doesn't really make sense necessarily to go with upfront radiosurgery. And sometimes we consider uh, you know, st- stabilizing the patient before radiosurgery. We work very closely with some of the medical oncologist or whomever is administering the systemic therapy because it's a similar idea. We really want to make sure that uh, the chance for longer survival of the patient is, is reasonable. Obviously, performance status, uh, interval from the initial diagnosis, these are all additional factors that we consider. Um, and, and, and sometimes if there's significant, uh, well, and very importantly, right, if there is a concern for cord compression, where there's a lot of tumor touching or putting pressure on the spinal cord, then these are not great patients for really dose escalation. Um, they may be considered for surgery to either uh, debulk, stabilize, or at least at the very least, remove the tumor around the spinal cord to give us that distance that Dr. Bilski was mentioning in order to allow additional dose to the tumor. Uh, we, uh, when we exclude patients from radius root, as I mentioned, if it's relatively recent radiation, there's already progression. Sometimes these uh, tumors are so... Uh, radiation uh, resistant that uh, we need to give a little bit more time for the spinal cord to even have some capacity for partial repair from the radiation. And obviously, if there's any additional concerns about patients being able to physically tolerate being on the treatment machine. Um, the local control with uh, radio surgery and even in the setting of uh, re-radiation has been excellent, generally 90% or higher at one year, uh, even with uh, in some cases very uh, what we consider traditionally to be radio resistant histologies. Uh, as I mentioned, the mass t- type of uh, tumors, spine tumors, uh, do tend to have worse local control with conventional radiation, and we feel much more strongly about using dose escalated radio surgery. Um, we know that uh, in, in some cases, uh, that oligometastatic treatment, ablation to two or three metastases, can actually allow patients to live longer. Um, th- these were patients um, not milk. just with spine metastases, but uh, all different sites of disease. And, uh, and we know that uh, there's some evidence now that ablating everything can certainly lead to improved survival. And so we t- certainly take that into account. 
I will just uh, speed up and mention that um, there are developments in terms of considering using more um, or less invasive ways to separate tumors uh, from the spinal cord using even uh, laser interstitial thermotherapy to give us that separation, uh, that distance that uh, allows to deliver higher doses of radiation using, using SPRT. The last point I will add is that uh, just a month ago, another randomized trial of radiation uh, spine radiation, uh, randomized to either spine radiosurgery or conventional radiation, um, RTG 0631, actually did not see pain, uh, better pain relief with radiosurgery. Uh, in fact, they saw at three months slightly better pain relief with external beam radiation. And there's a lot of lessons from the, the results of this trial. One, they use a lower dose, 16 gray, was uh, 16 gray in one fraction to 18 gray. Um, it's a lower dose, lower PD than 24 gray in one, or certainly 24 gray um, in two fractions. Uh, they did not consider SINs uh, scores and stability up front before a treatment. They allowed the external beam radiation to be delivered to a wider treatment area, one level above and below the target volume. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, a lot of patients at uh, one or two years, um, whether it's not feeling complaining this pain score or just um, you know, uh, not surviving, it was a relatively small proportion of patients available at 24 months. That said, there were, there were very low uh, risk for um, uh, toxicity. Uh, the vertebral compression fracture risk was the same in both arms, 20%, uh, which, which was very uh, reassuring. And there were no spinal cord um, toxicity from um, any of the treatments. Uh, but certainly, I, I think the idea is that having patients be seen at a high volume, really expert center for spine radiosurgery, I think is critical. This trial allowed it to be done at any center that enrolled. Um, and I think sometimes um, perhaps not having that expertise in terms of setup, planning, um, your dosimetrist, your physicist, your radiation therapist, and your multidisciplinary approach um, can, be, can potentially be a huge detriment for patients. And with that, um, I will... Um, I believe we're basically out of time. So yeah, long-term questions. We need to figure out um, long-term outcomes of radio surgery compared to different conventional radiation. What's the optimal dosing? Is it single fraction, two fractions, five fractions? And perhaps how to optimize radio surgery with additional advances in systemic therapy as well as uh, in, in, in surgical interventions. And with that, uh, appreciate your time. Dr. Ahn, spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a logistics question. Um, who should call the shots on how to treat patients? And before you say tumor board and uh, team effort, uh, the practical reality is most tumor boards that I know of uh, in the systems I've worked at uh, meet once a week, and there's always one particularly charismatic person who kind of wins the day. So just give us a realistic decision-making process of who is in charge? I, I literally, I have a patient downstairs on rounds this morning who asked that, who's in charge? Who calls the shots? Um, who is the go-to person? And how do you resolve conflicts beyond the weekly tumor board where you usually start elaborately with the first three cases and then run out of time in the last 20 cases? So just give us a little uh, advisory note on how decision-making in an ideal world and from your experience, real-life experience should work. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, you know, I think the best answer, unfortunately, is it, it all depends, right? Uh, in the inpatient setting, you're, you you don't have as much time. Um, as a consultant, you have to see the patient, you have to examine the patient, and you have to figure out the acuity of the situation, right? If it, this is core compression, um, you have to very quickly figure out if the patient, uh, what's the histology, could upfront radiation make sense? Or a lot of times, um, yeah, with core compression that's highly symptomatic and someone who's healthy, they probably need surgery, but it's really having that conversation uh, with inpatient team, with uh, if available if available spine surgery um, upfront, uh, critical. Now, a lot of times we also see the metastatic patients in the outpatient setting. A lot of times they're being referred by the medical oncologist, and so uh, it's critical to really have that connection um, upfront, right? What what is the patient and the medical oncologist looking for? Um, is it pain relief? Is it uh, is it really prophylactic where they're really trying to prevent something from happening um, in the spine, in the brain? Um, is it where they've run out of options um, and um, they wa don't want to start the next systemic chemotherapy and we want to do ablative treatment? So uh, certainly from a radiation design standpoint, that's that's our team, but we have to very, work very closely with the medical oncologists and the spine surgeons. May I ask a follow-up question pertinent to that? Yes. Let's say a patient has been radiated and let's say a, a round cell lesion that should usually be very radiosensitive and the spine is collapsing under our eyes. 
how long should we wait with surgery if that's just inevitable in radiated tissues until we can safely intervene? That's a great question. Um, if it's a, if it's emergency, I mean, there's you don't have to wait. A uh, part of the idea is though is that sometimes when you have radiosensitive tumors, they even when they melt, that can inc- actually can actually augment instability, right? If there's something that was bulky there, once once it kind of uh, dissipates quickly, um, that can actually be more problematic. So I, I don't, you know, if you're concerned about instability. You can go in with surgery even, you know, during radiation or right after. Obviously, ideally, you finish the course of radiation um, because any delays within the radiation course reduces the overall efficacy. But um, most tumors are not as radio responsive. Most tumors can take certainly many weeks or several months for, you know, maximum, um, you know, reduction size. And some tumors, we don't see any reduction size. Uh, we just see if with local control, uh, no further increase in the size of the tumor. But for in these rare circumstances where you have very rapid uh, reduction size, um, you know, I, I don't recommend waiting. I mean, the, that reduction can actually cause instability issues. And uh, Dr. Mendel, do you want to comment on your partner's excellent lecture? How often do you get into conflict with this wonderful partner? <laughs> uh, not often, which is great. Um, <laughs> and maybe I can add to what uh, Dr. An was saying, Jan, and that is that as much as you say it's not a, you know, who makes the call, who makes the shot, you know, we sometimes as spine surgeons, we, we used to take care of the traumatic injuries where it's our call. And many times the infection cases with somebody with epidural abscess where it's our call of just move on with the surgery. I think that with cancer, it's a little bit different in a sense that we, I, I don't think we should think immediately as a spine surgeon, and, and it's one of my slides, but we have to think as an oncologist first uh, before we think as spine surgeons. We are we are tuned to save neurological uh, issues and we have to decompress, and it comes from our traumatic experience and our infection experience, but with tumors, it's a little bit different. And so as much as we want to call the shots, I think with these type of cases, the multidisciplinary aspect is very, very critical, even on the inpatient patient. So if you can get red on input quickly, if you can get the medical oncology input quickly, that adds to ultimately the decision making. And Han knows, and I say it all the time, when you put a consult to radiation oncology, we do not want the typical consult that says, if you guys don't do surgery, we can radiate. That's, that is not helpful. It's we really need an input as to, you know, whether this is something that reasonably should be radiated, can be radiated, cannot be radiated. Um, it has to be a very interactive and a, and, a, and a meaningful input from our team. And when it comes to patient with tumor, that is that is critical. Just wanted to uh, thank you for the great talk. Can you hear me okay? You know, yep. one of the things that I think is a huge point as a as a spine surgeon is, and, and I really appreciate the point you made, is um, finding these centers of excellence, um, trying to get our patients there in time. Um, I, I don't want to belabor this point too long, but what have uh, some of the resources you've seen um, been helpful in getting patients over to you guys uh, to in order to really, uh, you know, get their treatment underway? Um, because when we see people that are in extremis, obviously we need to, you know, get them decompressed, but getting them the ideal treatment, getting them these, these newer progressive uh, radio treatment surgeries, um, you know, what are some of the things that you've seen been helpful to the patients that come into you guys? Say for me, um, it's, uh, when we hear from the referring or you know, whether it's medical oncologist or outside uh, neurosurgeon, it's really making sure the imaging is there, scheduling everything. Uh, when they come in for consultation, we do the radiation planning. So we start the planning right then and there um, because things do take uh, some time. And I also make sure that, um, you know, uh, doc, that Dr. Bedell is, he's able to see the patient soon after. Um, a lot of times when I hear about a patient, I'll directly include him and his team. And, and um, you know, we, we aren't able to always see the patient together, but certainly something that we sometimes try to do. Uh, just because of how much time it takes. Great, thank you. Let's see next. Are we back into the lab, or which is our yeah. next lecture? Yeah.